Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, space fans will often talk about the Apollo program's technological triumphs, citing the massive Saturn V rocket as evidence. It was a glorious monument to the application of science and technology to solving a problem which seemed like fantasy merely a decade prior. However, we often forget that there were other parts of the program which developed high-tech hardware, which was never intended to go to space. Some of the items were never even intended to leave the ground. And so I felt that it was important that we give these some love. Mission control really came into itself in the Apollo era, with the large displays and the rows of consoles becoming the standard which would endure long after the end of the Apollo program and right up to the modern day. While a lot of effort was going into making computers that were small enough to navigate the spacecraft from the Earth to the Moon, the consoles in Mission Control were powered by more conventional mainframes weighing several tons, which meant that each console was a dumb display powered by computers running in another room. These were IBM System 360 Model 75 computers. They ran in NASA's real-time computer complex. They processed all the flight telemetry and integrated it into the displays. There would be two of them operating in tandem and providing a hot backup in the event of a failure. Each of these weighed a couple of tons and supported up to a megabyte of memory and could execute 670,000 instructions per second. The System 360 was actually launched in 1965 and it's proven to be so influential that there was clones of it built and there's actually supposedly still some software that occasionally runs on compatible systems 50 years on. Anyway, this cutting edge technology allowed the computers to generate the real time displays for each console. But it wasn't like plugging each console directly into the computer with like an HDMI port or anything. No, the computer supported text terminals, which could display numbers only. There wasn't any lines or any column headers or anything. Instead, what they would do would be display each terminal with the numbers on it and then they would overlay on that a slide which would have the column headers and other markings on it. Then there would be another camera pointed at this and the signal from that camera would go to the console. Switching between these was like switching channels on a TV. It was actually possible as well for multiple consoles to display the same channel. For example, if the flight director wanted to look at something from guidance or from ecom, it was possible to just select that channel and see that critical data. Everyone, of course, also had the headsets with push-to-talk microphones. And these worked like a bit like a conference call with multiple people on a single channel or loop. Controllers would typically listen on multiple loops and talk on one at a time. The consoles also incorporated an air tube system for sending documents around. So, for example, if a controller wanted a hard copy of some data on the screen, he could push a button, it would be sent to a printer which would run it off and then it would be sent through a tube to his desk where he could then, of course, pull out a slide rule and start doing other math or whatever controllers did with that stuff. Those large screens that dominated the front of the room, they were all produced by rear projection using a combination of different slide projectors. There would be static slides, dynamic slides with the elements moving around. There would be plotting sliders where you have a dark slide that you can scratch off you know, areas to let the light through. And something called an IDAFAR projector, which is a really cool piece of archaic technology. I mean, you've probably never heard of these things. But in the 60s and 70s, this is how you displayed TV images. What it was, was you would have a flat surface with a mirror on it and a very thin film of very viscous oil. Then you would have an electron beam scan across it generating the image. And what this would do is it would deposit an electric charge. The electric charge would cause the surface of the oil to ripple. And that meant that then when the light was shone on it, the light would be deflected slightly. And that would actually then allow it to pass through a shadow grill and therefore allow it to project onto the screen. And this is how they were able to display, say, the live video of the astronauts up on the screen in real time. Anyway, I could probably talk all day about uh, Mission Control and its hardware. But uh, an interesting thing about Mission Control hardware is that instead of taking live telemetry, they could take telemetry from simulators elsewhere. 
So simulations were, of course, very important to training the crews, and they had existed for many years prior. Uh, the Apollo hardware actually started out as a direct evolution of the Gemini hardware, even down to using the same computers, DDP224, I think, or two, uh, two, uh, whatever, and the same motion platforms. But Apollo required simulating two vessels at once, and that required multiple computers for each um, spacecraft. So at one point, you know, you could actually have multiple computers on the running the LEM, multiple computers running the command module, and then these sending the data off to the computers at Mission Control for one giant multiplayer simulator. Yes, I think this might be one of the first multiplayer simulations out there. Yeah, the computers would actually talk to each other by using 8K of shared memory. And yes, in case any Kerbal players are wondering, it did support revert to launch because it had the ability to save and reload state. But of course, these computers were far too primitive to actually produce photorealistic graphics for the simulation. The views of the moon would actually be generated by flying a camera or moving a camera on a robot arm over a simulated surface. NASA actually employed a team of artists to generate these lunar landscapes in relief, uh, from obviously from data that was supplied by the Lunar Orbiter program. However, these computers were powerful enough to enable one of the world's first emulators because to run the simulation properly, they needed to simulate the Apollo guidance computer. And this was no small achievement. The DDP-224 was 24-bit. It used two's complement integers. It used floating point numbers and it had you know, named registers. Whereas the Apollo guidance computer, it was 16-bit. It used one's complement integers and fixed point numbers. And yeah, it put its registers all into memory. An engineer called James Rainey made it happen. He came up with software and hardware modifications to make this work because, of course, this was possible in the days of discrete transistor logic. Being able to emulate the AGC meant that changes to the code could be added to the simulators much more quickly without having to re-implement it in a different language. But probably the most spectacular simulators used during the Apollo program were the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle and its successor, the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle. These did the flying for real, but they simulated the moon's gravity. The way they did this was that they had a jet engine in the center, and when they would take off, this would be locked in place. They would fly it up to altitude, carried by the weight, the, the force of this thing. And then when they reached the altitude, they would switch into lunar simulation mode. At this point, the engine would move on a gimbal, which would keep it pointing downwards and only generating 83% of the force required to hover. The other 13% or one sixth would be provided by peroxide rockets in the base. There would be a set of reaction control thrusters fueled by peroxide, and that would therefore simulate the motion of the vehicle in one sixth gravity. There was a computer on board that would make sure that the jet engine always was pointing down. It would automatically account for things like gusts of wind. So the pilot would actually fly and experience it as if it was in this low gravity. And the big difference is that if you're in a helicopter in 1G and you turn to the side, you accelerate sideways a lot more quickly than you would if you did it in one sixth of gravity. So the pilots would learn that they had to turn a lot further if they needed to control their translational velocity. By the time Neil Armstrong was landing the Eagle in the Sea of Tranquility, he had flown almost 100 flights in the research vehicle and the training vehicle. And he also holds the distinction of being the only astronaut who had to eject from one before it crashed. There were two other trainers which were crashed by test pilots, but those guys weren't astronauts. Of course, there's many more stories, but these are the few that came to mind when I thought of this. I'm sure you guys will let me know the really cool stuff that I've forgotten. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.